Okay, so this is a walkthrough for the review for transformations and functions uh, for Algebra 2. So let's get right into problem number one. Okay, so your first problem, uh, your first set of problems, one through three, are asking you uh, about the domain and the range and some basic information like what is f of negative 4 and f of 4. So let's go through them one by one. So my first diagram is what's called a discrete function and what that means is that we did not connect the dots okay, between each of my points like we did in number 2 or in number 3. Okay, So uh, when they talk about the domain for these we're actually just gonna list so I'm gonna make a little curly bracket and I'm gonna list the x values uh, that if I go along the x-axis, there is a point above. So if I go over and start way to the left, I see a point above negative 4. Okay? And I see a point above negative 2. And I see a point above 2 and 4. And I see a point below 5. So as long as there's a point kind of in that uh, vertical with 5, I'm going to count it. So I'm going to say negative 4, negative 2, 2, 4, and 5. That's it. That's the domain. There's nothing in between them because I did not connect these lines. So the range is the same thing, except I'm going to look uh, on the y-axis and see where I see graphs. So the range, okay, I'm going to start at the bottom, and I'm going to say there's a point at neg uh, to the right of negative 2. So that's a part of the range. Okay, there, if I keep going up, I see next to 1 okay, on the y-axis. Next to 2, I have a couple of points but I'm only going to list them once. I'm going to say 2 has at least one input value and then 3 over here to the left I see one as well. So I'm going to say this, this is the list of all of the output values for this function. Okay. So now I'm going to say um, and if you want, uh, just really quick about this domain, if you want a, um, a quick kind of thought about what's really going on here, if I were to list these points just off to the side, I'm only going to do this for this one, I'm going to say these are the points negative 4, 3 and I see the point negative 2, 2, and I see the point 2, 2, and I see the point 4, 1, and the point 5, negative 2. If you were to look at my list of x values from these points, that's really what I listed here. And if you were to look at the y values, okay, that's what I listed, except these repeating twos don't show up. But all of the values that show up on this list are also showing up in the range. And that's really what we're trying to get at. What are all the points, uh, the x values of the points, and what are all the y values of the points that are on this graph? Okay? So that's, that's what we mean when we're talking about domain and range, if that helps you to think about it. Okay? So f of negative 4, when we put the negative 4 inside of the f, we're really saying uh, that is the x value, that's the input. So I'm really saying there's a point in here that's negative 4 comma something. What is the something that goes with the negative 4? So we can go over to negative 4 and go up to the graph and say that there's a point negative 4, 3. And so my answer to what is f of negative 4 is the answer is 3. Okay, we're filling in that blank. So f of 4 is doing the same thing. We're saying 4 comma something and it looks like 4 comma 1. So f of 4 is 1. Okay. Letter E is doing something different. <clears throat> it is not asking about the input. It is saying, I know the output is negative 2. So kind of like the Y value is negative 2. So now it's going like this and it's saying something, what is X, so that my output is negative 2. So there's a point on here, something comma negative 2. So I'm going to go to my Y axis to negative 2 and I can go over and see that the X value that goes with that point is 5. Right? So X has to be equal to 5 in order to get an output value of negative 2. Okay? So moving on to problem number 2, same kind of thing. Here's the difference. I can't just make a list of points because now I've connected the values, which means like, for example, there's this point here, negative 4, 1, and there's another point, or negative 4, negative 1, and there's another point at negative 3, 1, but all of the space in between negative 4 and negative 3 is also a part of the domain. Like, for example, like negative, it looks like negative 3.5 also has a point. And if I did like negative 3.25, there might be a point like in here somewhere. Right? So because I connected these lines together, now I can't actually make a list because there's just an infinite number of points okay, in the domain. And so instead of using just a list, what we're going to do instead is use an inequality notation. So when we're talking about domain, we're basically saying, what values on the x-axis get covered by this graph? And so the way that I think about this is, um, does the graph go forever to the left, and does the graph go forever to the right? And if it does, 
we cover everything. If it stops going to the left or it stops going to the right, then we're eventually going to cover maybe everything in one direction but not the other, or maybe we'll cover everything in both, or we won't cover everything in both directions. But when I'm looking at this one, I'm seeing an arrow here that's going to the right, to the left, and I'm seeing an arrow here that's traveling to the right as it goes down. So it looks like I'm eventually going to cover everything to the left, and I'm eventually going to cover everything to the right, and so I'm going to say my domain is everything. Okay, going up and down, let's try that. So again, I'm going to say the same kind of thing. I'm going to say, is this graph going to go up forever and down forever? And the answer to that is actually no. It does travel again down forever. Right? These lines both go down, but it's stopping up here. Right there is the highest point that it is. So it looks like my graph, if I'm looking at the axis, is going to travel from this line and down forever. Okay, and I'm going to cover all of these y values, but never anything above that red line, because that's where the y values stop going up and start traveling back down again. So it looks like I'm going from 3 and down. And so how do we write 3 and down using inequalities? We'd say the y values that are less than or equal to 3. Okay. The other questions I'm just going to go through quickly because they're the same thing. It says, what is g of negative 2? So what is the output at negative 2? Well, it looks like I have to go up to 3. Okay. And what is g of negative 3? Well, it looks like I have to go up to 1. So 3 comma, negative 3 comma 1 is on this line. E says g of x is negative 1. So they're saying something comma negative 1. Well, it looks like 0, negative 1 on the graph. Right? So I would say my output, let's, let's be accurate. The answer to this is the x value has to be equal to 0 in order to get an output value of negative 1. Okay? So problem number 3, the domain, if I think about left and right again, Okay, is now not everything because it does travel to the right forever. Right? I have an arrow over here that's saying go to the right forever, but it stops on the left. So this line, this little line here okay, is kind of my stopping point. And I'm going to go to the, to the right of this line forever, okay? but I'm never going to go to the left of this line because of that endpoint. So again, I've got to think about how do I say negative 4 and up when I'm talking about inequalities, and I'd say all of the x values greater than or equal to negative 4. Okay? And now let's do the same thing with ups and downs. Okay? So let me get rid of this line. And let me think about how the graph stops or starts going up and down. Well, I'm, again, this point is really important because that's a stopping point. It does go up forever. Right? So this is going to travel this way forever. So it's eventually going to cover everything up. Okay? But it kind of stops right here at this negative 4 and stops going down and turns around again. So there's really a, a stopping line right here. The graph stops right there and won't, doesn't really go below that anymore. This one, it's kind of like, well, it's, yeah, it stops going up here, right? But it does go up on the other side. So it does go up forever, even though this point right here stops. The other side of the graph lets it go up forever. So I'm going to say, in this case, it looks like the value is negative 4 and up are used, so I'm going to say y is greater than or equal to negative 4. Okay? So g of negative 2, I'm going to go over to negative 2 and down to negative 4. Okay? And then g of negative 3, it looks like, is this point right here, negative 3, which I'll just squeeze in here, which you might not be able to see. Okay? Negative 3 is my answer as well. And negative 1, I'm going to say, well, it looks like I have to go over to an x value of 2. So when x is 2, the output is negative 1. So we should be able to look at a graph and know domain, range, inputs, and outputs using function notation. Okay? <clears throat> so problems 4 through 7 are very similar, but they're using um, full graphs, just stating whether they are what the domain and the range is. So let's just kind of quickly move through these so we can talk about uh, some other types of problems. So state the domain and range uh, for each of these functions. So the domain for problem number 4. Okay. Um, does it go to the left and right forever? Well, this arrow indicates it goes to the left forever. This arrow indicates it goes to the right forever. So because it's covering everything in both directions, all real numbers. My range, again, think about whether it goes up and down forever. Well, this arrow is indicating that it's going to go up forever. So even though this line tops off at 4, the left-hand side does cover everything above 4 when it goes up forever. So it looks like it really just has a low point, right? This one right here, okay? It, ne there are no down arrows that are going to send it below that point. So it looks like it covers from negative 1 and then up forever. And again, I know you're probably looking at this and saying, look, it stops at 4. 
so my range should only go up to 4. But the left-hand side does go above 4, so we are going to include numbers above 4 as well. So I'm going to say my y values are greater than or equal to negative 1, because they don't go below negative 1, but they do go up forever. Okay. Um, and if they say, is this relation a function, I would say, yes, it is, because it passes the vertical line test. I can draw vertical lines wherever I want, and I'm never going to get uh, the vertical line hitting the graph twice. So I would say it is a function. Okay? So my second problem, again, let's think about lefts and rights, so I can do my domain. Okay? <clears throat> so it looks like this only travels to the right forever, but it does not travel to the left forever, and it kind of stops right here. So it looks like from negative 3 on the x-axis and up, gets covered, so I'm going to say x value is greater than or equal to negative 3. Okay, but it is going up forever, and it is going down forever from the two arrows. So I'm going to say in this case that the range is everything, because it does go down forever, and it does go up forever. Okay, um, And this is not uh, a function, because if I go like this, there you go, my vertical line just hit the graph twice. So it is it has an input value that has two output values, and that's bad. Okay. So let's take a look at problem number six. So problem number six is actually a little bit strange. Um, you really have to look at the interpretation of this. Um, if, if we're looking at this arrow saying that it's going down forever and going up forever, okay, we're it's kind of not a, good, not a great graph for determining that. But if we assume that's true, then I would say in this case it's going to the left forever and to the right forever. So because it's going to the left and right forever, then... I would say that the function uh, covers all real numbers. And if it's going up and down forever, if it gets to, oops, if it gets to that point where it's go, it just gets to this point and then just goes down straight like this forever, and it does the same thing going up, well, it's eventually going to cover everything up and down. So I would say all real numbers. Okay? The other possibility is maybe you looked at this graph and you said, well, maybe it just continues this pattern. And again, this is kind of what's unclear in, in the diagram itself. If we assume that it continues the pattern and goes down to negative 2 and turns around and goes back up, and in this case it's down at negative 2 and it goes up to 2, right, and then turns around, if it continues in that pattern, then the range might would be um, between 2 and negative 2, which we'd write like this. Okay? So depending on your interpretation of what this graph is telling you, um, it might be all real numbers if it just goes down and doesn't turn anymore. But if it goes down and then turns like the rest of the graph does, then it might be between 2 and negative 2. So not a great graph. Not a, um, it's not a clear graph, so it depends on your, your interpretation. I'm not going to do number 7 because number 7 is pretty much the exact same thing as this problem number 1 as far as domain and range go. So I'm not going to sit there and list out all the points. But the same idea, list all your x values, list all your y values from all the points. Okay, and you should get the idea there. Okay, problem number eight. Okay, so in problem number eight, I am giving you uh, three functions at the top. Okay, f of x, <coughs> g of x, and h of x, and then I'm asking you some questions. I'm saying evaluate the following and show all work. So uh, in letter A, and I'm only going to do a couple of these because again they're repetitive, and you should get the idea after the first couple. So um, in letter A, it says f of two. So what this means is go to the f function plug in a 2 anywhere you saw an x and tell me what comes out of this. So we're giving the input value of 2 into the f function. So I'm going to say f of 2 is equal to 4 times 2 minus 10. So 4 times 2 is 8 and 8 minus 10 is negative 2. So I'd say f of 2 is negative 2. Okay. So I'm going to do a different one. Well, let's do g over here because I have space for g. So g of negative 2 says go to the g function, which is this one, plug in a negative 2. So I'm going to say g of negative 2 is 2 times negative 2 squared minus 7. So be careful with your order of operations. Negative 2 squared has to be done first, which is 4. 4 times 2 is 8. 8 minus 7 is 1. So I'm going to say when I plug in a negative 2, I get back a 1. Okay, so the other two problems, B and D, are the same thing. Plug in the values, and in both cases, into H, and tell me what comes out. Okay, so I'm going to do, uh, let's do letter F, because that one's more fun. Okay, so in letter F, this one's a different question. It's saying, tell me what X is, tell me what I should input so that my output value becomes negative, or becomes 1. So what this means, different than above, it, is it saying, I don't know what x is. So I'm going to leave that 2x squared minus 7 alone. But I know that when you plug in whatever value of x we're trying to find, this should equal 1. 
Okay, so this letter F is asking you to find X, whereas the one above it is telling you what X is. So notice the subtle little difference in how the question's asked, but it means the complete opposite. So to solve this problem, I'm going to add the 7 over and find out that 2X squared equals 8. Divide both sides by 2 to find out that x squared is equal to 4. And then when I square root both of these, I get two answers. I get 2 or negative 2. Okay? So if I plug in a negative 2 or I plug in a 2 into this uh, g of x, the claim is that 1 comes out. And if you go up there and you check that, that is the case. So the same thing with this letter e. I'm saying set 4x minus 10 equal to 2. Tell me what comes out. Right, and you should be good to go. <clears throat> okay, so problem number nine. They're saying complete the table for r of x is equal to 2x squared plus 3. Problem number nine is asking you to do the exact same thing that problem number eight asked you to do, except it's doing it in table form instead of doing it in just um, each problem asked separately. So in this case, I'm basically saying do r, this, that when I say uh, this negative 2, I'm really saying what is r of negative 2? When I plug in a negative 2 here, negative 2 squared is 4, times 2 is 8, plus 3 is 11. So I'm saying the point negative 2, 11. So again, I'm not going to go down the column. I will just show you that um, this one, so let's, well, let's give you the answers anyway. Uh, so when I plug in a negative 1, it looks like I get back a 5. When I plug in a 3, it looks like I get back a 21. Okay? This last one is, again, doing the opposite. This one's saying um, that r of, oops, not f, okay, r of x is equal to 5. And so we'd, we'd actually come up to the top here where, where there's some space and say 2x squared plus 3 equals 5. Okay, what goes into the x column? And in this case, it looks like the answer is 1 and negative 1. Both work in this x spot. And you can actually see negative 1 had a 5 as an output, so that's not uh, entirely surprising. So 1 and negative 1, when you solve that equation at the top, they will both work. Okay, so let's look at our last set of problems about transformations. So this is a completely different topic, not talking about domain and range, not talking about uh, graphs or um, function notation. So the first part of this is we're going to look at the top, and it says for all of these problems, 10 through 13, we're going to use this function, uh, the absolute three times the absolute value of x plus 6 minus 4. Okay, and so this represents a transformation on the parent function, which is just the regular old absolute value of x. So the first thing they want to know is what are values for a, b, c, and d. Okay, so if I'm looking at this a, b, c, and d, um, remember a is multiplying outside of the function, so this is my a, and that's three. Okay, d is adding or subtracting outside of the function, so this is my d. So I'm going to call that four or negative four. <coughs> C represents adding or subtracting inside of the function, but we have to be careful because the notation looked like this. Remember, it was b x minus c. That's this is kind of like the generic uh, definition of for for transformations. So, if you notice, this has a minus sign in the function, and mine has a plus sign. So, if I said, "What did you have to plug in right here to make a plus sign?" Well, the answer is that you needed to plug in negative 6. Okay? And then B, I'm going to leave blank, and you're more than welcome to leave this blank. Our problem does not have a B value that changes the parent function. Technically, we would say that B is equal to 1, but um, for our purposes, if you don't list it, just list the ones that are present, and that's fine. Okay? So let 11 is basically saying, now that you know what the values for A, C, and D are, uh, tell me what they do to the parent function. So what happened to our nice graph of the absolute value of x once you changed the parent function to look like g of x? So let's start off with um, a. Okay, so a is going to do a vertical stretch okay, by a factor of 3. And again, what that means is that all of the points are now three times as far apart going up and down as they used to be. Okay, my C is uh, negative six, so it's going to move the graph to the left six units. Okay, and then my D is going is a negative four, so that's going to move it down six units. Okay, so that's all I'm doing is I'm looking at 
A, C, and D, and I'm saying, well, what do they do? What are their definitions? The only thing that's not really showing up here, which I just want to point out as a possibility, is if A was negative 3 instead of being positive 3, it's possible that I might also, for A, have to add in reflection over the x-axis, okay, if that happens as well. So keep that in mind, okay, that they, you might see reflections for A as well. Okay? So problem number 12 is now saying, all right, well, we know how generally the graph's going to move, but let's say we have the point negative 4, 4, that is on the absolute value parent function. Where will that point go after we apply all these transformations? And so to remind you about what this is going to look like, okay, we have this uh, handy little table, which will not be provided to you, but that you should know, okay, that looks like this. And what this describes for us in just kind of a quick shorthand is that B and C act on the X part of a coordinate. A and D act on the Y part of the coordinate. And this makes sense because these are left and right movements, horizontal movements, and these are vertical movements. Uh, B acts by multiplying. A acts by adding. Uh, a acts by multiplying and D acts by adding. Right? So I'm going to apply this A, C, and D that we, we talked about up here. Okay. Um, to the function. <clears throat> so we're going to go in order. This also helps us remember the order that we have to do things. So first start off with B. We didn't have a B up there, so we can skip that one. The next thing says, okay, A, okay, I'm sorry, C, add the C value to the X coordinate. So my original coordinate was negative 4, 4, and we are going to add the C value to the X part of our coordinate. So our C value up here is negative 6, and so I'm going to say add negative 6 to the x value. So negative 4 plus negative 6 is negative 10. Okay. And then it's let's move to the next one. It says multiply the a value by the y part of the coordinate. Oh, let me finish this one up. Uh, 4. Okay, so this was my c transformation. And now I'm going to do an a transformation. So it's negative 10 comma multiply the a value by y. Well, my a value, if you remember up top, was 3. So I'm going to multiply 3 by this 4 and get a 12. Okay, and then my last transformation, which I'll move down here, uh, is a d transformation. It says add d to the y value. My most recent y value was 12. So when I add negative 6 to that, my final point is going to be at the point negative 10, 6. So the answer that they're asking for is the point negative 4, 4, after I transformed and I stretched and slid this graph all around, ended up at the point negative 10, 6. Okay? So the last one says, state the domain and the range of the vertex and the vertex of g of x. So here's what you got to remember. My parent function, my original parent function uh, for absolute value looks like this. Okay? It's a V-shaped graph. Okay. The the graph the uh, vertex of that graph is at zero zero. Okay. The domain it looks like is everything, and the range is y greater than or equal to zero. So this is kind of basic facts that we did learn about the parent function of the absolute value of x. And so we need to think about just how the transformations changed this stuff. So by going to the left six and down six. My graph kind of ended up kind of left 6 and down 6, kind of like over here. And it's stretched, so it's going to look a little skinnier. So it's going to basically look like that. So if I ask what the domain and the range of this are, remember where this is down at negative 6 now. So the domain for my new function didn't change because I was covering everything, and so I'm still covering everything. So my domain is still all real numbers because it's going to the left and the right forever. But now my range is covering the y values greater than or equal to negative 6 because we slid the graph down 6 and now we're covering those new values and my vertex moved and you can kind of quickly again glance at our sketch here it looks like we went over I'm sorry down 4 I wrote that wrong this is a 4 okay? I'm looking at this and wondering why it's 6 and 6 so we went down 4 units with this d value sorry about that okay so this is really a negative 4 and this is over at negative 6. So my c value is negative 6. Okay? So that's going to fix, change some things. The down 4 makes this an 8. So sorry, I've got to fix all of our problems now. Okay, and this is now uh, down 4 units. So that's going to make this negative 4 instead. So sorry, my 
devalue. Hopefully you caught that and made those changes. So <clears throat> by going down four units, we subtracted four from 12, which is eight. And down four units means that we cover from negative four up. Okay, And that makes my uh, vertex the point negative six, negative four, which again, if you notice, is just my C value and my D value. Or you could look at the sketch and say, if I went over six and down four, I end up at the point this zero, zero ends up at the point negative six, negative four.